Did you hear about the hungry lion who was roaming through the jungle looking for something to eat? He came across two men. One was sitting under a tree and reading a book, and the other was intently, incessantly writing in his journal. The lion quickly pounced on the man reading the book and devoured him. Even the king of the jungle knows readers digest and writers cramp. <laughs> Once there were three lions sitting on a hill and they were getting hungry and below them three men walked by, a Frenchman, an Italian, and a Czechoslovakian. The lion said, I haven't had French food for a while, so he ran off and ate the Frenchman. The second lion said, well, I'm hungry for some Italian food, so he ran off and ate the Italian man. And the final lion looked at the sole remaining man and he said, I guess it's my turn to spring for the check. <laughs> this first chapter of Daniel sets the stage for why Babylon's leading party of royals wanted Daniel thrown into the lion's den. That comes around chapter six. Those royals were too, uh, felt that Daniel was too well respected and had the king's attention. Most of all, they were living, he was living by his religious rules. Daniel's story does not just begin as a vote for vegetarianism because the whole issue was what the diet of the training event was going to be. It was about the battle between the kingdom of God and society's politics. Politics attempt to engulf God's covenant people in a godless culture in this story of Daniel. And today, we proudly call it the separation of church and state, regardless of what our founding fathers thought they were doing. Daniel and his three friends are in a training program to prepare for government service. That was not a problem. The problem was the way in which that training demanded the embrace of pagan gods. Now you might say that politics today is far from the embrace of pagan gods. However, the values of even our political system, a capitalist democracy, has its challenges to the Christian way as it promotes corporate agendas and challenges Jesus' agenda of a preferential treatment of the poor. We live in a country where we practice our faith without fear for our safety and with few legal repercussions, yet we often live as if we were more frightened to publicly claim our faith than Daniel, who was a captive in a foreign land. When it comes to admitting that we are followers of Jesus in conducting our public life, are we faithful or chronically do we compromise to avoid discomfort, embarrassment, or conflict? When we refrain from praying in public before meals or when we have guests because we say we don't want to make others feel uncomfortable. When we let others take over our Sunday mornings, without claiming it's sacred for worship and Sunday school, because we say we don't want to be troublesome to others. When we rationalize skirting the law for convenience, personal gain, or thrill, because everyone else does it. When we go along with the wayward choices of the crowd because we claim we don't want to seem pompously pious. Is it coincidence that as mainline Christians have become less open and more passive about their faith that the members of numbers of people in organized churches has declined and the public is more likely to associate Christianity with those more vocal branches that are mean-spirited, judgmental, and divisive? Back to Daniel. Daniel could have decided faith was really a private matter. So what's the big deal about closing the window shades and eating food that had been dedicated to a Babylonian God? Daniel could have decided to give up on God altogether. Daniel faced the same kind of temptations 
we and some of our extended family face when it comes to being a faithful, unashamed public follower of our Lord. Jan Daniel chose to continue to live his faith unashamed as a public follower of Jesus, who had not yet been born, but of the God of the Israelites. His, belief, his behavior lasted all his life, from the beginning, which we heard this morning in chapter one, until he was presiding over large portions of Persia at the end of his life. Caught in the evil plot of others, not just once, but if you remember, it happens again towards the end of his life. He gets thrown into the fiery furnace, first into the Daniel's into the lion's den and then later in his life into the fiery furnace. Daniel held on to his faith in God. So perhaps our question for today is what lion's dens have you faced? What fiery furnaces have you experienced in your life? What circumstances or events did you think would devour you or destroy you? Perhaps the loss of a spouse, the job, or the dreams that you have held. Did you, perhaps you felt trapped by the hungry lions of cancer, flooding, as many in the South have experienced, one bad news story after another. Have you ever felt that there would be no escape from the overwhelming demands of school or work or debt? Like Daniel, we may have prayed fervently for a miracle that would spare us. Or perhaps it's our loved ones we pray for. The pain and the challenges of choosing between being godly people and being acceptable people. You know, peer pressure doesn't end in school. Peer pressure goes on and on. Maybe most of all, some of us have experienced the implications of rejection from the upward mobility offered by Daniel, to Daniel by being brought into this training program. This training program could have been his, his ticket to all kinds of accolades. If you'll just conform to what we ask. Have you ever heard that phrase? There's great rewards if you just conform to what we ask. God's grace is not magic, and God's goodness does not mean that things always turn out the way we hope. But the grace and the goodness of God does mean you don't have to get it all right in order for it to be all right. Believing God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Is what allowed Daniel to stick to God's diet. <laughs> to what was acceptable in the teachings of God. Now, since the days of the Israelites' journey in the wilderness and their, their landing in Israel and them being captive people in Babylon and their return to the land, a lot has happened most notably Jesus Christ our Lord. And he helped us understand that it wasn't just legalistic adherence to God's word, but a deep communion with God that allows us to understand what God's agenda truly is in a sometimes difficult and godless world. The battle became focused at the dinner table for Daniel, not because it is wrong to enjoy good food, but because for Old Testament believers, Dietary rules were very much an expression of their obedience to God. And for the people of Jesus, the followers of Christ, we have such a profound choice to make. This idea that Jesus moved among the unacceptable and provided for them in his vision of the kingdom and asked us to do likewise is the most challenging place for us. God's people continually find themselves in cultures that offer the temptation to sell out our commitment to God and Jesus Christ. 
We feel challenged in our Christian walk. And the only way that we can continually be renewed is to be able to invite those who are also challenged alongside us to join us in understanding God's call in their lives. Daniel 1 reminds us that when God's people refuse to cave in to cultural pressures and choose instead ways of obedience, God's blessing results. In the scriptures, as I'll, I'll be discussing with the confirmation class, and I'm so glad that, that they continue to lead among us as liturgists, there is a, a sense of categories. And one of the categories is moral stories. Moral stories that help us deal with the culture in which we live. And Daniel is one of those moral stories. It didn't come chronologically ages before Jesus Christ. We understand today that it was written even after the life and death of Jesus because people were still challenged by the culture in which they lived. That it is a moral story that helps us understand how devastating some of the peer pressure is for Christians today, for people who follow God. We all want to stay out of the lion's den. We all want to stay out of the fiery furnace. We all want to live a life that's comfortable where only good things happen. But our faith being tested is an opportunity for us to know what's truly important in our lives. The way to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and walk out of the lion's den is to faithfully pl place our trust, our resources, and our lives in God's hands. At the end of their time of testing, Daniel and his friends were not only physically healthy, the scripture says, but they also possessed a knowledge and insight that the secular culture could not give. And I'd like to say to you, what a wonderful, what a wonderful and, and kind of um, plot twist reality it was that these Israelites who were slaves in the land, who were nobodies, became the leaders of their, of that land until the day when they were allowed to return to their own land. This is a well-crafted moral story. This is a well-crafted directive to you and me today, that we're not supposed to hide in some, some hermitage, but we are supposed to infiltrate the culture, that we're supposed to stand as the proud people of God who have abilities to lead and responsibilities to do so. Consistent to the end, Daniel survived greater challenges with greater rewards, and Daniel remained in Babylon until the first year of King Cyrus, when the first exiles returned home. May you and I remain steadfast in this day and age until the day that we're called home, representing God's will for a culture that says almost anything goes, almost anything goes, and might makes right, and all those contradictory things that the scriptures of Jesus Christ speak against. Let us rejoice in the good news that God reigns.